welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. It is such a joy to be gathered as God's people together. I do especially apologize for those who may be worshiping with us online because we're a little late getting started today. And I know if you're online, you're watching your computer, you're wondering, what's going on? Those in the sanctuary just enjoyed a little bit of extra time to visit with one another, and you're welcome for that. Uh, as we begin our service, I want to start by making sure that you know, whether you're online or in person, that you are above average. Yes, yes you are. Uh, this, this comes from two sources. Uh, one is from Chuck and the other is from Jan. Uh, the above average has to do with the fact that um, we're still celebrating uh, getting through that matching campaign and uh, blowing it away uh, by over, I think we were over $5,000 over the matching campaign. So we're, we're still basking in the glow and celebrating that. Um, that that was not just this congregation, but also people who love this congregation. Um, but it was a great opportunity to uh, acknowledge and express how important this ministry is. Just as you do every Sunday, because the regular giving is a part of that as well. Um, also, you are above average with your, with the, uh, your generosity with the uh, One Great Hour sharing. Um, I believe there's a figure in the bulletin, but it's a little over $500. And a lot of it came in in fish banks, right, Chuck? Chuck loves counting coins, he loves the fish bank. They're his favorite. Um, and then finally, you're above average with your peanut butter collection. Every month at the beginning, or yeah, it's the first Sunday of the month, we collect peanut butter for our friends at the United Christian Outreach. And uh, I believe, Jan, what was the total? Around 20 jars? 23! And the average is usually 18, so you're above average. <clears throat> All right. Um, other announcements to make as we begin is to acknowledge that uh, Festival <clears throat> International is coming up, and that is one of the opportunities that we sell parking so that we can uh, support our youth and children going to Camp Agape. So uh, if you are, sorry, I just jumped in and gave your announcement, didn't I? Do you want to add anything to that? <laughs> Um, I like the way that you acknowledge the fellowship opportunity, and it kind of touches back to the study that we did, the, the Lunch and Learns, on the different habits of evangelism, that uh, fellowship is a way in which we build those relationships and we actually demonstrate faith in our community and with one another. So you're, you're doing all of it. It's raising money for the kids to go to camp. It's evangelism. It's fellowship. All the things. Uh, so <laughs> sign up after church for that. Um, also, uh, there is... Uh, I sent an email out uh, stating that we had um, vision and mission statements that we've been working on. Last fall, we surveyed the congregation, asked you what it mattered that we were the church, what it mattered to be here. And uh, we, we took your feedback, and the session's been working on that. And so there are some, um, and I apologize, I don't have printed copies of it, but those were emailed out. If you have any further uh, feedback you want to give to those, you can talk to me after worship about that or any member of session. And uh, we'll, be, we'll continue that conversation actually next week, because next Sunday is when we will have uh, May 7th, after worship, let me start over, before worship, we're going to have a time to go over some of the small church options that we've talked about in our small groups and with, from the Committee on Ministry, uh, just to kind of define those during that meet and greet time. But then after church, we're going to have hear a report from our small groups and uh, others that wish to give input, and we're going to see if we, as a church, can make a decision. I believe in you. We can do it. Uh, about The decision would be about God's calling for us, and the next steps, and uh, what, we, what we feel led to do as a congregation. So that's all coming up next Sunday, and I'm glad to talk to anybody about that uh, after church if you want to. Oh, next week is April 30th. I love being corrected. So that's in two weeks. I'm ahead of the game. I love it. 
is when we'll have that actual meeting. Okay, are there other announcements or corrections that need to be made? Outstanding. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat that so that those who are online can hear it. Um, your children with Camp Akadi, uh, Theater Akadi, sorry, um, are performing for the first time a French production that children are doing at Festival International. And your children are going to be in that. Outstanding. We look forward to that. Yes. Actually, can you go ahead and grab a microphone yeah. so that people online can hear you and I don't have to repeat it? We had a good day yesterday at Vermilionville's Earth Day event, um, telling people about creation care and um, you know, our, our uh, Earth Care Congregation designation through the PCUSA. And um, we had uh, been planning to have a table at UL's Fete de la Terre as well, but it got moved to Monday, and due to unavoidable work conflicts, we're probably not going to be able to ta have a table there. And, but if somebody wants to staff the table, we can still have one. But otherwise, we're kind of planning on not participating this year in UL's event. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll say a few comments about that event and also the other event that took place on um, uh, Saturday, the, the garden event. Both of those will be mentioned a little bit later on in my sermon. Okay, let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship God together with all that we have and all that we are right here online, everywhere in God's presence. Please rise in body or in spirit and join me in the call to worship. 
a new season is coming. The old is past and gone. God calls us to new commitments and new actions. waters of baptism remind us of God's claim upon us, God's covenant to always love us. Join me in the call to confession. God understands our plight because Jesus was tempted as we are, yet did not sin. Let us now open ourselves to God's mercy as we admit our shortcomings. Let us confess our sin against God and our neighbor. Let's join our voices together in confession and then silently and personally before God as well. Let us pray. Mighty God, who sent the promised power of the Holy Spirit to fill disciples with willing faith, we confess that we have held back the force of your Spirit among us, that we have been slow to serve you and reluctant to spread the good news of your love. Have mercy on us. Forgive our divisions. And by your spirit, draw us together. Fill us with the desire to do your will and to be your faithful people. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear now, O Lord, silent and personal confessions that we make in the chapels of our hearts. Amen. Beloved of God, let us assure one another of God's forgiveness. By grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and set free in grace. Thanks be to God.
please be seated, and the younger disciples are invited to join me down front. You guys are already front. You want to be on this side today? Yeah? yeah? Okay. We'll be on this side today. Folks who are worshiping online, I wish you could have seen the congregation. It was as close as Presbyterians get to actually dancing. <laughs> kind of did a little bobbing, a little weaving. In church, that is. I mean, you know, anyway. All right, so um, where do you think I found these? Outside, that's a good guess. <laughs> Where outside? They look like I bought them. Yeah? What do you think? Where outside? Where? Not in my yard, but in the church, around the church. Did you know we had such pretty flowers around the church? Yeah. They look fake? They're not. They're real. So you can touch them. I know, yeah, yeah, they're so good. And you know what, there's actually, see this little guy? You know what that is? It's a baby orange. Setsuma, whatever. Anyway, so um, y'all may know we have some, an orange tree over that way. So um, I picked these today just to show you how beautiful things are just right around the church. And um, the orange tree was planted there in memory of someone, but it was also planted so that there would be oranges in case somebody who was walking by was hungry and wanted an orange. That's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. So um, I'm showing you these things because today is a day that a lot of people talk about, or this, this week, yesterday, really, is it, a lot of people talk about Earth Day. Have you all heard of Earth Day before? Yeah? So a lot of people, Earth Day is important to a lot of people. Why do you think it should be important to us in the church? What do you think? Because earth takes care of us? That's a good answer. Good answer. God gave us the earth so that we would have the things that we need. But also, God gave us the earth so that we could take care of the earth. So, all these little plants, do you think there are bugs and things that might live on them sometimes? Okay. Do you think they're part of God's creation too? Do you think they're, they're part of this congregation too? Do you, think they're presby- you don't think they're Presbyterian bugs? No? Okay. They probably are a little above and beyond the denominational thing, but they're God's creatures, and we're all part of the same space. So that's what I want you to think about, is that um, there's some beautiful things just right around here, right under our noses, and that God has given us, given them to us to take care of us, but also so we can give back to God by taking care of these things. That's what Earth Day is all about. So let's say a prayer. And then those who want to go and stand up. All righty. You're going to repeat after me, please. Hi, God. God. It's us. us. We love you. you. Thank you for the earth earth. and beautiful flowers and and yummy plants. plants. Help us to take care of them. them. Amen. All right, y'all can go with Miss Dorinda or back with your parents or grandparents. Join me in prayer as we approach God's holy word. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first reading is from Acts 2.14a and 36-41. You can find it on pages 19 through 20 of the New Testament in your Pew Bible if you would like to read along. The reading follows the gift of the Holy Spirit, which made it possible for all who were present to hear and understand what Peter had to say about Jesus. Listen now as one who has received God's Spirit to Acts 2.14a and 36-41. 
Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus who you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exerted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed this message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. Here ends the first reading. Our second reading is from 1 Peter 1, 17 through 23, and you can find it on page 232 of your New Testament if you would like to read along. 1 Peter is considered a pastoral letter written to console and encourage believers who were persecuted by Rome as belief in Jesus spread through the empire. Listen to these words from 1 Peter 1, 17 through 23, as they instruct us to consider what they endured in times of hardship. If you invoke this father, the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not a perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. Here ends the second reading of God's holy word. Our gospel reading comes to us today from Luke's gospel, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. You can find that on page 90 of the uh, New Testament in your pew Bible if you'd like to read along. Uh, This passage is the Familiar to many of us, story of the walk to Emmaus. Whole uh, spiritual journeys have been centered around this passage. It's deep and rich and wonderful, and I encourage you to consider what God might have to say to you through this passage today. Luke 24, 13 through 35. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels 
who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all of the scriptures. As they came near to the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Bless you. In my house, we say bless you after somebody sneezes. My sister once told me that if you sneeze in church, you don't need to say bless you because you're in church and you're blessed. But I wanted to say bless you because it goes right along with the first thing I was about to say, which is that spring has sprung and there's a lot going on. Whether you're out enjoying God's good creation or getting involved in some important social cause or just trying to keep the grass mowed without getting taken down by your allergies, it's a busy time of year. In fact, yesterday there were at least three places in town that you could celebrate Earth Day. We already mentioned a couple of them. Uh, there, were, there were two places where members of our church were pretty busy, uh, one down at Vermilion and the other at the Southern Garden Festival. Uh, Clancy hosted a table at the Earth Day celebration in Vermilionville, and, uh, and I went down there and was, was with her for a little while. And there were several others, uh, again, at the uh, Southern Garden Festival at Sarah Scheffler's house. Now, um, while I was able to, to get to both of those, they each offered something amazing. And that one thing that they shared in common is conversation. Some amazing conversations took place in these spaces. And each of our texts today have some element of conversation. And they remind us that God is active and present even when we're too busy to notice it, particularly in the space of our conversations. I want to say a little bit more about that. But first, before I get too far afield from Earth Day, I want to acknowledge how it matters to our conversations about faith and about the presence of God that we talk about Earth Day. Now, Earth Day is, of course, a secular holiday, if you want to call it a holiday. I have a certain kinship with this day because it began in 1970, the same year that I began. Now, that means that many of you in this room grew up without an Earth Day. It doesn't mean that you did not grow up caring about the Earth. In fact, there is much that I learned about creation care that I learned from my grandparents and my parents. Their generation, grandparents and my parents, they were, those were the ones who came up with the idea of Earth Day in the first place. And it is important that we teach our children and their children to honor the Earth as a gift from God. I love the way that we were taught by the children this morning that the first thing to consider is that it's a gift from God. It's how God provides for us. It's a gift from God. And we've been created to tend the Earth as stewards of God's good creation. That's why our session has pursued and through your regular practices and, and ongoing things, attained the status of an earth care congregation. Now, that may or may not be news to you, may, may or not know what that even means, but it's connected to our practices of recycling and recovery from climate disasters, our presence at community events like Earth Day, our partnership with the Native Bee Lab, um, all these things that we're just doing because it's an expression of our faith. 
and all this work that we do intentionally learning about the connection between creation and our connection to the creator, creator like what we did during meet and greet today and like we do every year at, at uh, Camp Agape. Now, all of this is just one aspect of the stuff of life that we're walking in with and walking through as we approach these texts. In Acts, Peter is addressing the crowd that's been gathered for the Festival of Weeks just after the disciples have received the Holy Spirit. In 1 Peter, followers of the way of Jesus are being addressed while they navigate life and faith in the face of persecution by Rome. In Luke, two random disciples, one named Cleopas, which is Greek for vision of glory. Gives you new respect for that name, doesn't it? Cleopas, vision of glory. They're on their way to, to Emmaus, walking and talking. Now, in each of these stories, there's a story about a part of it that is about conviction. And in each of these, there is an element of conversation to be considered. Peter is addressing a crowd in Acts 2, but there's a dialogue with that crowd. They respond. He tells them that Jesus, whom they crucified, is the Messiah. And they respond with regret and remorse. And then they become baptized. Every time I read that, I think, what a great problem that would be to have, you know, 2,000 people be baptized all at once. They repent, they become baptized, they begin to share things in common and to care for one another as members of the household of God. Now we have no, long, no idea how long that lasted, but we do look to it as a, as a kind of ideal for what it means to follow the way of Jesus. Now as this newfound faith begins to move out from Jerusalem and into Rome, we find that there are some communities that are better at this than others. And as Rome takes more interest in these communities of believers, Peter is writing these letters, or at least he's said to have written these letters, to encourage these fledgling communities. Now, I say it that way, said to have written these letters, because scholars disagree over the actual authorship of the letter from Peter, but they do agree that they were written in his name to encourage followers of the way of Jesus. And what we find in the portion that we've shared today is an expectation of action along with belief. Essentially, he tells them not to expect that just because God raised Jesus from the, de from the dead, that you can bank on the power of God without the expectation of love. The power of God certainly purifies our souls, and it does that so that we can love one another mutually. God's love is not just a get-out-of-conflict-free card, as much as it is an invitation to a party. God's love offers an experience of the everlasting. And it is an ongoing invitation to experience it in and through our love for one another. That sounds great, doesn't it? Our love for one another. And that may sound a little bit like a platitude. You know, you can say that and then do what you want. Or, or maybe an unattainably idealistic thing to say. Our love for one another. But I don't think so when you stand around that table and meet and greet and you hear the conversations that happen in here. I, I do also want to remind you of something that I said earlier. These passages are about conviction and conversation. They are intended to challenge us towards recognition and interaction. And that's exactly what happened to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. We don't really know why they were going there, but we can guess. Now, one thing to note is that the author of Luke's gospel is also the author of Acts and the Apostles. So this story that we're receiving about the road to Emmaus comes before the earlier one about the gift of the Holy Spirit and uh, Peter's address to the crowd. So at this point in the story, it's right after Easter. The women have just returned from the tomb. Peter ran and found strips of cloth. And these two guys bolted out of town. They weren't, they weren't even going fishing, which is what happens in Matthew's gospel. The disciples immediately returned to their old lives and professions. These guys just took off to a town that was kind of out of the way, too. Now, along the way, they're traveling, and they pick up a, a straggler. Not uncommon. It wouldn't be weird to welcome someone who was traveling alone to join with safety. But I'm, I'm sure that they needed to make sure this guy wasn't a threat in some way. And maybe that's why they were talking about Jesus as a sort of disappointment. They did not want to identify themselves, out themselves, as actual disciples. But they could say what everyone else was saying. 
We thought he was going to be the one to lead the revolt. We thought he was going to be the one to restore the nation of Israel. Of course, Jesus, the stranger in their midst, was the one to tell them how foolish they were for lacking understanding about the expected death and resurrection of the Messiah of God. While there's some part of me that still holds out hope that these two were simply playing dumb out, out, out in the midst of all this, that's, that's not really what the text says. It really seems like these guys' hopes have been dashed. But there's something about the genuine faith of this stranger that awakens their compassion. They're compelled by his hope in the Messiah, and they prevail upon him to join them. The text doesn't say how or why they did not recognize him. Well, it does say their eyes were kept from seeing him. I, I like to think he was wearing a kind of a robe with a hood, like a shrouded Jedi entering negotiations, but, you know, that's, that's just me. You could certainly say that he was the last person they expected to see. But I tend to think it was because they didn't really want to see him. Jesus had not measured up to their expectations of a Messiah. And so they were not expecting to see him. If anything, they were trying to get away from all the Jesus nonsense. Yet this poor sap seemed so sincere that they just had to invite him in. Then he took bread and broke it and their eyes were open. And they said, weren't our hearts burning within us? And they ran back to Jerusalem, regardless of the hour or the risk. And now that question comes to us. Do our hearts burn with conviction when we hear about the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus? And say what you will about the mythology and competing stories from other religions and records of history and whatnot. But there is something significant about the sacrificial love of God that makes me realize that I am loved beyond compare, and I hope that is the same for you. That there is something significant about the sacrificial love of God that makes you realize that you are loved beyond compare. And when I hear that Jesus died for my sins, I, I admit that, that I have competing emotions around that. They range from wondering what I could have done that would require someone else's death in order for God to love me, to realizing that, number one, I do have some stuff to confess <laughs> every Sunday during that silence that we all share. And two, I participate in systems that enslave and oppress every day. We all do. Now, if that's all there was to it, then I'd be left feeling pretty bad. Hearing that God not only offers forgiveness, but anticipates my participation, my participation in the emancipatory love of others, well, that just lights a fire in me that moves me from guilt to hopeful expectation. Hopeful expectation of new life found in conversation with God. The beautiful thing is that these conversations are where we stumble upon the presence of God, who is already with us in the strange places and faces, waiting for us to realize how much we matter to God. I tr truly think that is the valuable thing about our time together, is these conversations that we have. But it also is a part of what makes our time spent in conversation in other places so very important. Yesterday in Vermilionville, Clancy and I were at a table with Jesus. Jesus was in the form of a woman with young children making creation collages and challenging me on the institution, uh, the institutional church and the Pharisaic nature of the church that Jesus seemed to oppose. It was a wonderful conversation. Jesus was there in a couple who had lived through storms and wanted to talk about the importance of faith in disaster recovery. Jesus was there as a traveler from another country who just wanted to rest and interact with another person for a little while. Likewise, I saw Jesus at the Garden Festival. Jesus was there as a woman with a child handing out cookies, an old friend serving tea, a church member who sat at a table and just created community around us. Je Jesus was there as a beekeeper, as an artist reflecting the beauty of creation. Jesus was there as adults teaching children to create art using objects that they had found. Yes, Jesus was in the mix because he was at the heart of all. Jesus was there at the heart of it all and the chance, the, the beginning, sorry, the heart of it all, the thing we were all there for was to care for families who were seeking permanent housing. 
That whole thing was a fundraiser for Family Promise. You know, it's amazing how we can be convicted and involved in so many different things at once. And yet, that is the calling of those who follow the way of Jesus. Now, I don't mean to say that we have to be everything to everyone or try to fix every problem. I mean to say that there is no part of life that God is not a part of. And that's important to remember as we engage in the stuff of life. As we engage in conversations about politics and conflict and real suffering in the world. And our hearts burn with conviction. So let us, in all these things, be open to the conversation that starts and ends with the grace and mercy of God. With our souls purified through the truth of our conviction that we are here to love mutually. Let us continue to honor each other and all of God's good creation as sources of deeper revelation of the presence of God. At least that's my hope, that it may be so with me and with you and all to the glory of God, now and always. Amen. As we stand, let us affirm what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, holy and wise, whose loving will and purpose all things serve. And in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord and Savior, who by his life on earth, his death for our sake upon the cross, and his rising from the dead brought salvation for the world and is now exalted Lord over all. In love and truth, then we Assuring them of the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ, enable them to know and obey the will of God. I believe in the fellowship of the redeemed, the one church of the Lord Jesus Please be seated. At this time, we bring together those joys and concerns that we share and bear. Uh, we've already talked a lot about how wonderful it has been to have a congregation that cares about the earth and can celebrate these things over the weekend. Um, 
I don't know how much was raised for Family Promise at the Garden Festival, but, uh, but I know that it was a very successful event and it was great to see those who were there. Other things we might lift up and joy or concern for one another? My mother is having surgery. Yeah, uh, that'll be uh, later in May. Um, so prayers for her as she uh, prepares for that. Um, and I, I also uh, have to point the finger at somebody. Um, there's, a, there's a guy over there whose name is Kim um, Steinhorst, who uh, was on the nominating, not nominating committee, the Committee on Preparation for Ministry when I first was becoming ordained in Chester, Virginia. So, um, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. but I'm, I'm a, you're a classmate of Karen's, who we're also thankful that Karen is here for a reunion, and uh, we're just glad both of y'all are here, and what a wonderful touchstone for me. Thank you for, for coming in and worshiping with us. Yes. Kids from the New Hope program are in New York with Hoochie Percussion. Outstanding. I'm so glad that they, they were able to accomplish that goal and I bet they're having a... Okay. Prayers for safe travel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Also performing at festival. Outstanding. Okay. Yes. A colleague in Clancy's department who's going through a health crisis and has asked for prayers. Dan was asking for prayers for his mom after some health concerns and ended that with, our God is faithful. Thank you for that reminder. Let us, oh, yes. Yes, thank you. Michelle uh, Honeycutt, who worships with us often and comes to our uh, Monday group and Wednesday group, her mom had a heart attack, so, and her, and her mom's name is Yvonne. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So we've had uh, a person who has uh, been on the church grounds at times uh, who is, there are several people who are on the church grounds at times who are without housing, and that's a big problem in our city right now, and we're downtown, and so we're going to be part of that. Um, so prayers for a solution, especially for any individual who might tend to locate here. Uh, we're not certain if the individual who had been staying here is still staying here, uh, but we are certainly still finding things around the church and um, finding people around the church. So we need to be in prayer for how to be uh, encouraging and faithful and compassionate, um, but also to be able to take care of the church and not put ourselves, well, you know, I, I was going to say not put ourselves at risk, but that's kind of what Jesus calls us to do. So, prayerful discernment around that. All right. Let's pray. Lord God, we give you thanks that you have given us such a wonderful community to be a part of and such a wonderful faith community to be in the middle of. We pray for those individuals who are experiencing homelessness, for those who may locate themselves in and around the church, that we might find a way to encourage them towards resources that could benefit them. We pray for this city that we might be moved with greater compassion to develop a better safety net than we currently have. We lift up all those uh, folks that we've mentioned, our, those who are in our hearts and our minds who we did not mention. We ask for your providence and your care in all things. We give thanks for this great and wonderful earth that you have given us and for the calling to care uh, for one another as we care for the earth itself. We pray all of these things in your son's holy name, praying as he taught us to pray about the essential things, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is a time of offering that we will now move into. This is a time in which you can consider God's grace and mercy in your life and those ways in which you might respond in compassion and those relationships that you've been called into. We, of course, have a plate in the back if you wish to uh, provide an offering as you leave today, or you can give online, as many do. Um, But again, it's not about the money. It's about your hearts, how we might, us, our hearts, how we might uh, respond to the grace and mercy of God with all that we have and all that we are in every chance interaction, every opportunity before us. Join me now in our prayer of commitment. Gracious God, you have come to earth in Jesus Christ to love us and save us. In gratitude for the precious gift of life, we resolve this hour to love Christ, fresh devotion, serve him with renewed energy, and to seek him in deep and prayer. Strengthen our commitment that we may bear the fruit of Christ's love.
Friends, before the charge and benediction, I want to remind you of the opportunity to sign up with Chris for that fellowship evangelism car selling stuff around <laughs> parking spell, not car, parking for uh, Festival International. Uh, she'll be waiting for you outside. Um, and uh, I feel like there was one other thing, but it's lost. Let us join in the charge and benediction together. We must keep our eyes open for the presence of God. We will look for God's activity all around us. God calls us to act with justice and compassion. We will strive to be faithful to our calling. Amen. Thank you.